Chapter 8 Same Destination, Alternate Routes You have a unique identity, calling, and mission to fulfill. And your story contributes to the grand narrative. Chapter Contents Section 1 Discovering Your Unique Identity and Calling Section 2 Empowered for Your Individual Mission Section 3 Chapter Summary and Evaluation Section 1 Discovering Your Unique Identity and Calling Chapter Prelude A few nights ago, as I was preparing to begin writing this chapter, I had an interesting perhaps even prophetic, dream. In my dream, I had finally gotten my dream sports car. I felt the sense that I had worked very long and hard for it and was finally reaping the fruit of my labor. I think it was a beautiful, new, black Lamborghini or a McLaren or something extravagant like that. It wasn't the exact car that was important. It was a feeling of pride, of accomplishment that went with it that I remember. It was the kind of car that you just knew when you saw it, the kind that screamed success that very few people could afford and everyone thought was awesome. I had it pulled up at a family member's house. Though I was in the driver's seat, and it was definitely mine, I don't remember having a recollection of having actually driven the car yet so I decided to go for a quick drive. But when I got to the street, it was having major issues. When I turned the steering wheel left, the tires went right. It wouldn't accelerate properly. It was jumping through the gears. The brake and gas pedals kept alternating, which would do which function. I can still picture this little small intersection I'm trying to drive in, and I am spinning out and recklessly darting back and forth, going from 0 to 60 in 2 seconds, to then slamming on the brakes to a screeching halt. Left, right, go, stop. It was terrifying. I felt like the car was possessed. Oddly enough, I made it back to the house, and I still offered, right after this episode, to drive the rest of the family to wherever we were going an offer they refused after having seen all of this. It was crazy. I was still willing to drive it. I clearly had zero control over this car. The reality of the car was far from the illusion of grandiosity I have built up in my mind. I still wanted to have the appearance of success and the feeling of success. I had cognitive dissonance which is what happens when you disassociate or separate and compartmentalize things in your mind. This is done so that you can hold two contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values at the same time and not even realize it. This occurs so we can be fully passionate about both things and not even realize that they totally contradict one another. The car was both a sign of my success and accomplishment and pride of doing well in life, as well as a sign of the fact that I had zero personal control or direction and am just being haphazardly thrown about. When I awoke, I immediately thought of this book, which has used the car and driving as a consistent metaphor. And then it dawned on me that I was about to begin this chapter about personal direction in life. I gave a sly smile to God as I thought about the many creative ways He teaches us things and let Him know that I've received the message. I actually thought that was the end of it, but now He's bringing another part of my testimony to my mind to share with you. Many years ago, I was at a crossroads in my life. This was before my call to ministry. I was working at an ad agency and for the latter half of my nearly two-year tenure was leading a department of one 
that managed corporate client email marketing, website design, and other forms of internet marketing. I was earning income at the agency as an employee, as well as through two small businesses of my own on the side. I had just finished getting Gazelle Intense, a term Dave Ramsey fans will understand, and getting debt free and rebuilding a fully funded emergency fund for the second time. In fact, that's what brought me to the agency in the first place. I had been self employed for years and wanted to remain that way, but my savings had taken a hit during the years following the 2008 recession. I still lived responsibly, but income wasn't always predictable. My savings dwindled down, and a credit card was used to float me during these income dips. A short term contract job would help me quickly pay off my card shred it, build my emergency savings back up, and get back to my previous plan. The long commute put like 25,000 miles a year on my car, at least until it got totaled when I was hit by a drunk driver. But I was a hustler, and determined, even though I had multiple sources of income, and was making more money than I ever had in my entire life my income vastly exceeding my low monthly expenses, I still decided to buy the crappiest 20-year-old egg beater replacement car I could find. I think it was like $1,500. Hey, it ran well and had AC, and that's all that mattered. I drove that eyesore for about a year until it needed an expensive repair, and then I debated what kind of car to replace it with. Now what I hadn't mentioned during the previous two years is that a lot more was changing than just my workplace and finances. At age 30, after 17 years of being a lukewarm Catholic and then 13 years of being a lukewarm Protestant, the Lord began to convict and call me to Him. I began to attend church weekly and listen to hours and hours of audio Bible studies throughout my long commute. I was also coming to the conclusion that advertising and marketing was not as fulfilling or where the Lord was calling me. Since my early 20s, I had always intended to make a difference in the world somehow, but thought owning a successful ad agency and influencing the world through it was the way I would do it. I began to pursue a more direct approach to helping people, including a certification in life coaching. I also invested lots of time into Bible reading and study, listening to sermons online and investing time into old passions of mine, including health and fitness, personal productivity, life optimization, and personal empowerment. My relationship with God had also grown a lot. I stopped living in sin, stopped allowing romantic relationships and my career or business to be my idol and began pursuing him wholeheartedly. After realizing how centrally important he is, I officially dedicated my life to him and declared that anything I do in the future to help people needs to include helping them understand their need for Jesus. So what kind of car did I buy? Here's where my story came to a crossroad. I was ready for a nicer car. Though I could have just bought it with cash, I didn't want to drain the savings I had just rebuilt. But I also really didn't want to wait another year to save up for it. I'd already driven an ugly cheap car for the past year. I thought to myself, I could get my dream car, which was a, which was a Mercedes-Benz. It was sleek, fast, all black and chrome, with a chrome front grille. I thought... I deserve it. I've saved. I've been smart. My expenses are low and steady. My income is high and consistent. The problem? To get the one I wanted, I'd need to get a car loan. Yep, I'd had to go back into debt. And I was seriously thinking about it. But I would be, well, sort of, smart about it. I was going to get a five-year loan, but aggressively pay it off in two years. That's a reasonable compromise, right? I get my reward now, and then I hustle for two more years. 
What's two more years? I'm still basically debt-free, besides a mortgage and now a car. And if I needed to, I could always either sell the car or just pull cash out of savings and pay it off instantly. That seemed reasonable. But there was one other problem. I would have to stay working at this job for two more years. It would be foolish and risky to be self-employed again with this debt hanging over my head. And I couldn't afford this car if I left the job. So that was my dilemma. I could have my dream car, get some short-term debt, and keep doing what I was doing. Or get a cheaper but still upgraded car and be free and flexible to do whatever God calls me to do. I wrestled with which was the right decision for several weeks. I prayed about it. It wasn't just about a car. It was about direction. The car was a symbol. It represented what was most important to me. If I get the car, it would control what my life would look like for the next two years. God was changing my perspective in many different ways and putting all kinds of dreams on my heart about a different career path, focusing on helping people directly. I would basically be hindering or postponing that for two years if I get this car. But I really wanted the car. I remember thinking, Lord, I wish I knew exactly what you were calling me to for the future. I remember thinking and saying to God, Lord, I wish you would just make this decision for me. That Sunday night, exasperated and sick of all the back and forth with it all, I decided, I'm just going to get the car. It might be the wrong decision, but I'm over all the indecision. I called my dad on the phone and said, I'm going to get the car. They have three slightly used, very low mileage versions of it at this dealership across state. Let's drive there this Saturday and I'll buy one of them. He agreed. Okay. It was the plan. I'm going to get the car. Just hours later, early Monday morning the next day, I was laid off. After the initial shock and upset, I began to think with wisdom. About halfway on my commute home that morning, I just broke out laughing. I looked up to heaven and said to God, I guess you answered my prayer and made the decision for me. <laughs> it, it occurred to me that I had made the wrong call, and he intervened to fix it for me. That's okay. It was a valuable lesson for me. It changed my trajectory. You may not be reading this book right now if that hadn't happened. I went home that same day on a new course and registered my company. Empowered Living Incorporated, and all of its subdivisions, including Empowered Christian, later to become Empowered Christian Ministries. I share this part of my testimony not because it's the most exciting or interesting. I'm sure many of yours are much deeper and profound, more painful or traumatic, more miraculous or amazing. I share it because it's an example of how God's will will be accomplished one way or another. And all of our experiences and decisions help form who we become and what we do. We're all navigating these roads of life in our own ways, making lots of decisions, some good, some bad. Some decisions help us get the most of our lives and callings. Some decisions hinder them in some way. But if we're trusting in God and always looking with wisdom for how he is moving and guiding us from the background, then everything that happens has the potential to be seen for whatever good it brings to the bigger story. You may see a job loss, whereas I see God intervening to set me on a right and very different course. Now, I'm not immune to the emotional consequences of losses and setbacks. I did experience other emotions. I did feel grief and depression about the job loss, disrespected that the company didn't value me enough 
to discuss with me first other ways we could address their concerns. Upset that they undervalued my talent and value. And even a sense of betrayal for all the sacrifice and long nights and everything I did for that employer. At one point during my first year there, I had stepped up into a leadership role and had helped hold their entire internet marketing department together by a thread. But after the bitterness subsided, I realized my heart was no longer fully in it the same way during the second year as it was during the first. God was already writing a different course for my life. I could sense it, and who knows, maybe they could too. A new course was coming into focus before my eyes. It just wasn't very clearly defined just yet. And just so you know, I think it rarely ever truly is. Every one of us has a unique identity. We're created as individuals and are special, valuable, created with a purpose in mind. All of us can say to God and join in with David as he says in Psalm 139, verses 14 through 16, quote, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and I know this very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days were written in your book and ordained for me before one of them came to be. End quote. You are fearfully, wonderfully, and marvelously made, and your days were written and ordained already before you were born. God tells the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, quote, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you a prophet to the nations. End quote. Now, it may not be your calling to be a prophet, much less a prophet in Israel, to many nations like Jeremiah was. Your calling may not be like mine, to start a Christian empowerment ministry and eventually write a book. Nonetheless, you have a unique calling. God has a plan for you and you're intended to play a specific role and fulfill a specific purpose. And all of the things that are part of your unique story are interwoven and interconnected throughout God's master narrative that includes all of our stories. Most of us will get our official invitation into God's mission through our conversion. The day we were saved and gave our lives to Jesus, we got a general idea of the direction we are to go in. That's when we got our new map. But you and I both know that a map is far from step-by-step -step directions, especially if the journey is years or decades long. What exactly we're supposed to do, our exact calling, our unique role, we never received that blueprint. You and me both. Key biblical figures like David and Jeremiah that I quoted from earlier played such an important role that God spoke to them directly. They received their calling like a personal visitation from the general himself. But for most of us, we just accept our draft papers and show up for duty. We find out what our assignment is once already en route, or maybe realize it when we're already halfway through it. Sometimes we don't even realize experiences are part of our calling until we look back in retrospect. After all, it wasn't the job loss alone that helped to carve my path, the financial problems with my business, the temporary contract job offer at the agency that was too good to pass up, and even the hit and run by a drunk driver that totaled my car. All these pieces played a role. Thank God that he didn't let me focus on what was wrong, but rather on what was right. I bet your story has similarities, lots of experiences that life would have been a smoother ride without, but you never would have gotten right here without them. We don't so much as receive our calling as much as we discover 
our calling. We get it piece by piece. We discover it reflecting backwards, inwards, and forwards. We discover it by closer examination of the situations we find ourselves in, by introspection into who we are as a person, by personal reflection of our past experiences and how they shaped us, and by the things God is currently putting on our heart for the future. This all makes it much more ambiguous and less clear, much easier to misinterpret His will or to come up with numerous possible roads for us to take. But this needn't worry you. If God had an extremely specific calling for your life, just trust Him that He would make it known to you in an obvious way, just as He did for David and Jeremiah. Not to mention Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, or John the Baptist. And if He hasn't made it razor-sharp clear, then it's because he has left our futures, at least for right now, flexible for us to follow the Holy Spirit's promptings of our heart. It's actually a gift. We can choose to enjoy the thrill of all of this. I say we because he is still carving out my path. God willing, this book isn't going to be the last thing I do. Choose to enjoy the spontaneity and variety of it all. Choose to enjoy the adventure and mystery of the ride.